Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Louis Schlieske and Hilmar Ort, who are the founders of Gelato, a project which makes blockchain devs' lives easier through automation and other things. We'll talk about this in just a bit. Um, but before we do, uh, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Omni is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet. Omni supports more than 25 protocols, so you can manage all of your assets in one place. But what's really special about Omni is what you can do um, inside the wallet. Want to get yield? Omni allows you to get the best APYs with zero fees and three taps need to swap. Omni aggregates all major bridges and DEXs, so you can bridge and swap across all supported networks in one transaction directly in your wallet. Love NFTs. Omni offers the broadest NFT support of any wallet, so you can collect and manage your favorite NFTs across all chains, all in one place. Omni truly is the easiest way to use Web3 and is fully self-custodial, meaning you never have to trust anyone with your assets other than yourself. And they support Ledger. Give Omni a try at omni.app. Cool. It's super nice to have you buy a both on Lewis and Hilma. We go way, way back. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty early on in your Web3 journey, you guys got a grant from the Gnosis Ecosystem Fund, but we'll get to that. Um, so maybe maybe tell us about yourselves and who you were before, you know, before blockchain and how you guys met. Oh, yeah. Hi, hi, Frederick. Of course, first of all, thanks for hosting us here. Excited to finally be on the FE Setup uh, podcast. Um, I remember still listening to it when uh, in the bear market times 2017 2018 and of course beyond that so so awesome to be here yeah maybe i, I can start giving a, like a, a quick background what where we actually how we came into the space um and i think as a sort of context what is uh, always interesting for me to, looking back is like we are all like post financial crisis sort of generation after 2028 and i think this sort of uh, had a, quite the impact in how we thought about financial systems um, and why we we were very eager to, when DeFi and, and Web3 came, came around to sort of participate in that. And um, Luis and I, we, we met, uh, I think we have like quite the same same journey, uh, the two of us. So, so I can maybe speak for the both of us. We, we met in, in high school actually already uh, in the UK um, then both studied in London. Um, I, I studied uh, finance. Uh, Louis politics. Um, he focused more like the game theory side of things, and um, yeah, we we then went to Berlin uh, because we we both had sort of like the 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 dream to become um, entrepreneurs, founders, uh, doing our own project, and so we we started to to learn the craft in that sense uh, in Berlin in Berlin, and at some point uh, started our master's degree there as well. Uh, and, and there actually we we met a. A colleague of ours who, who was uh, working at MasterCard and he kept talking about blockchain back then in like 20, 2016 and so on and uh, got us quite excited about it. And at the same time, the DAO started uh, and I read this article about it and I was super fascinated by it. And yeah, we uh, participated uh, in the DAO and we I remember we had to buy ETH on, on, on Kraken for the first time when it was like $8 and I was like, what is this ETH? I just want to participate in, in the DAO. And um, yeah, that sort of got us hooked. So, so we were like Ethereum natives. We didn't, we kind of skipped the Bitcoin part altogether. And yeah, that, from then almost just the, the rabbit hole uh, wrote our master thesis on like crypto. I think Louis, you on, uh, on, on POS consensus algorithms. And um, yeah, then we, we actually, uh, soon after our master, we, we started working at a, at a startup in Berlin that help projects like big European based uh, projects such as uh, Bayer or Novartis or others um, experiment with like uh, blockchains and e e EVM um, private networks and yeah, we help build those up. Uh, but their yeah, private blockchain things were I think a bit early back then and, and it got a bit boring. And so we decided to just like get out there, go back to research, learn more the in-depth engineering of everything. I participate in hackathons, literally went to like three, four, five different hackathons all around the world. It's just started building. And then had this idea about this, this, this DeFi application that we wanted to build, which was like a lending protocol on top of the Dutch X that we wanted to build. And I think this sort of like ties us in very nicely into how we met uh, you and the, and the Gnosis team. And yeah, then we remember we, we sort of started applying for, for grants like the Gecko one and 
yeah, this is sort of then how the whole journey officially started, I guess. I think you may have been our most successful Gecko grant receiver. Um, you actually um, submitted a proposal for something called Instant DX, and I actually checked it out last night again. It's actually it's pretty cool. Do you still remember what it was about? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, thank you very much, uh, Federico, for hosting us. Uh, I think Hilma and I completely share um, the history of our private and business lives of the last uh, 12 years. So I don't have to, <laughs> uh, basically everything uh, uh, I do, he does and yeah, uh, vice versa. So, so yeah. Um, so uh, actually, I do remember the Instant DX quite well, um, which is, uh, it was Hilma's and my sort of first uh, Solidity project other than hackathon projects before. And we uh, we basically looked at the Dutch X, which was a really cool idea back then. As always, Noses was very early, maybe even too early with, with these uh, great innovations. Uh, and the Dutch X was uh, a decentralized exchange by Gnosis that was based on a reverse Dutch auction mechanism. And one of the things there was that um, users or participants in the auction would have to wait to 20, up to 24 hours, I believe, for clearance. And then they would have to come back and remember to withdraw their proceeds. And this, of course, wasn't very great UX. It was very slow. You had to wait. You were impatient. So we were then thinking, OK, how can we uh, sort of make this better, right? And the first idea we had was actually very DeFi-esque. Um, it was basically um, having a pool of liquidity to um, front the proceeds of the auction because you, I think you were able to, at least by a margin, sort of deterministically um, have a guarantee of roughly how much a user would get. And uh, yeah, we would then uh, instantly X was, uh, was basically fronting this money. So you would be immediately able to withdraw a portion of, of your proceeds. And, and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that, that actually turned uh, as well into thinking about automating the withdrawals from the auction. And that's really when we stumbled upon the great uh, problem that is smart contract automation in the constraints of an EVM. And that's how we then realized, okay, actually automating withdrawals and so on is actually quite, it's not built into the EVM. It's not supported natively by Ethereum. So how, how do we do that? And, and then we realized, wait a second, there's a, there's like a whole need here for a generalistic automation protocol to allow smart contract uh, applications to be automated, to have automated processes. And that's how we very quickly then stumbled upon Gelato. I, I believe we already rebranded from Instant DX to Gelato in May of 2019 and started uh, the, the grant as Gelato back then uh, with our first mission to automate withdrawals from the Dutch X. Yeah, I think it's it's super important to kind of remember that this was four years ago. And basically all the things that kind of seem like commonplace now, back then they were, uh, they were cutting edge. <laughs> so as a space, we've, we've come quite, quite a way, uh, but kind of the fundamental problem or one of the fundamental problems with smart contract automation kind of boils down to the fact that smart contracts don't do anything unless they're poked, right? So I mean, you can't really say if this happens to that, then basically if, if that has happened, someone needs to tell the smart contract, hey, check again, um, sort of thing. Um, so can you talk about um, that problem that you're trying to um, alleviate? Yeah, maybe maybe I can... I can start, Louis, feel free to jump in, of course. Um, yeah, so I think the um, foundational problem um, that like Gelato uh, or like the, the initial mission that we wanted to solve with smart contract automation was that um, that the, the, like the blockchains, the processes run on, on EVM blockchains like Ethereum are finite. So um, if you want to execute a certain business logic, which you encode in a smart contract, let's say you want to transfer funds to, to a friend, um, let's say every day, for example, then these, then you define this sort of logic uh, within a smart contract. And then the actual business logic of that smart contract is actually only run if someone sends a transaction to it, right? And so if you think about what automation is, automation is sort of, okay, at very granular intervals, I would like, like preferably at every block, I would like to run the sort of logic that is in the smart contract to then determine whether to send the money to my friend or not. Um, and then there are so like two options how you can achieve this on, on, a, on, a, on an EVM blockchain. Uh, one is you just send a transaction at every block <laughs> to that smart contract, right? Which of course uh, is not really feasible because we all know 
Um, there's the spam protection mechanism with having to pay gas for it. And especially when, when we started on Ethereum, it was just completely infeasible because a transaction can cost like $20 if you're unlucky. Um, and so the other um, way of doing this is actually to have this sort of off-chain computation network that does that simulation for you, um, not on-chain, but off-chain. And then once uh, your conditions are met and can be fulfilled on-chain, it actually will uh, execute and, and send the transaction on your behalf. And, and this is basically what the the, the, the the base problem was that we wanted to solve, but we wanted to solve it in a generalistic way. We started with the sort of withdrawal issue, but then we realized, hey, it's not only the Dutch X that has that problem. If you want to do limit orders on Uniswap, for example, it's the same problem. If you want to do liquidations for lending protocols, it's the same problem. So we, we realized that DeFi, especially in DeFi at the beginning, uh, it's like a, the, the, the use case uh, array is just uh, infinite. And so that's why we started then building this generalistic solution for it. Gelato kind of boils down to kind of, you know, being this marketplace. But in principle, you could have also just offered the service, you know, as a, as an infrastructure company, right? It's, I mean, there's plenty of those out there who, whom you can just contract and they kind of run, you know, the DevOps side of, you know, you know, the blockchain business for you. What kind of drove you to kind of um, building this very generalistic um, solution? So um, basically our mission here was to bring smart contract automation without trading off uh, the core properties of Web3, like self-custody, you know, um, um, private keys. Um, so one way to achieve automation is by giving up access to your private keys, giving up access to your crypto assets, whatever they be, and give them into the hands of a um, service server company or something, and they then execute transactions for you from your account. But that would essentially be like what banks do nowadays, right? Like they control all of your assets or, or Facebook controls all of your data. And that's how they can actually bring automation in Web2, which is which ha brings these very cool Web2 user experiences. So in Web3, the problem was, okay, how can we have automation whilst not, you know, forcing users to give up custody over their funds and so on? And that's why we started with a smart contract protocol before we even built any servers. We first started with a smart contract pro protocol, Gelato V1, which had some very, uh, like, I think now uh, functions that have been copied as well a lot and so on. Like it, it sort of set its own standard of smart contract automation which, with these on-chain functions, can exec. So can, can I execute here on behalf of a user and then exec? And during the on-chain execution, a user or an application would be able to define their own business rules into the smart contract, which make it so that, uh, you know, the Gelato bots can... First of all, they don't need access to your private keys. They can execute for you via smart contract mechanisms. And also at the same time, these smart contract mechanisms can enforce certain business rules, right? So that the bot cannot just, I don't know, for example, in a limit order uh, on Uniswap or on PancakeSwap, uh, which uh, uses Gelato limit orders, actually, um, a user, um, like a bot, a bot can only execute a limit order um, to at the right price, right? Like these are very important business rules that are enforced by the smart contract so that as a user as a user you don't have to trust the gelato bot to execute at the right price like you know that the smart contract logic protects you and uh, as a bot you are incentivized to execute uh, at the right price because then the transaction will be successful and you will get a small reward for it so so these sort of encoding these rules into smart contracts was essentially what we started with and that that was like the first big version of of gelato uh, and uh, interestingly now we are also looking into how we can remove um, the reliance on just smart contracts because um, smart contracts and uh, blockchain computation is somewhat limited, right? Like it doesn't work with a heavy computation and so on. And, and now we're also chipping away at the problem of, okay, how can we have off-chain computation be secured and, and somewhat like trustless? Um, and, and, and yeah, so we're working on that as well. I want to hear about, uh, I want to hear more about this in a little bit, that's the the private beta that you just released, right? The the Web three functions. L let's maybe get to the um, to to the core of it first. So um, you just said that basically bots do stuff for me if I want to automate stuff. So who controls the bots, and how do I buy the service from them? 
So who controls the bot? So we have um, what we call sort of like gelato, gelato nodes, right? And and um, from him, and 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 these are basically entities that are running, um, yeah, nodes for you. They are like like you can think of them as similar as like an Ethereum node, for example. Uh, just with the difference is that they are not um, validating blocks or, or, or proposing blocks and validating them. They are. Um, verifying and checking certain tasks on your behalf all the time and then executing them and, and making sure transactions get included into the blockchain at the right time for you um, and then getting getting paid for to, to, to do that job, right? Similar to how you pay um, an Ethereum node, uh, the transaction fee of of what you what you uh, have to pay. And and who is who are running these these nodes? Uh, so so today um, and this is actually what we. Uh, so at the very beginning, we were of course running running the nodes ourselves, um, and this was so like the the bootstrapping phase of Gelato. Um, Gelato was always designed to be this sort of unstoppable Ethereum like protocol, which tries to get as close as possible to the trust minimization guarantees that Ethereum provides. Um, at the very beginning, we we started very boots, like bootstrappy and said, okay, let's build all the tools first and everything, and then get to that point uh, uh, later. Because the great thing about how we started um, with is that the trust minimi- the trust assumptions were very little because we could enforce it all on chain and smart contracts, right? So the only thing Gelato could really do for you at the very beginning was not execute your transaction at the right time. But we we like we couldn't rug you or something. Like the limit order would still always execute, and you would always get the money, or it just wouldn't execute, right? So, so that was the great thing how we could start, and and also not worry too much about like the decentralization methods as as long as we have reliability uptime, uh, right? And so we like sort of perfected that process, and now I think, and we will go there probably in a second. We are moving much more into. Uh, how can we offload that computation that is done by smart contracts to enforce certain data integrity of like, okay, what price to use to execute a transaction or let's say what route should I use to get the most optimal price, right? These things that are very hard to uh, enforce on chain. How can we do that in a trust minimized way off chain? And this is where decentralization comes into play. And this is where you have to basically build up a, a network of node operators that has stake similar to like an Ethereum proof of stake um, and, and follows a certain protocol that is encoded into the clients that if they break it, they will get penalized. And if they follow it, they get rewarded. And, and this is actually what we uh, started launching last December. So, so it's now just like a major upgrade we'll actually announce pretty soon. Is already conducted, and we already have external node operators running um, on this network today. Uh, for example, staking facilities they're running Lido nodes and, and, and other uh, nodes for other company, other projects. Um, and like by the end of the year, um, yeah, it's, it's it's it should be that there there's no or like the, the reliance on us is, is very little to none. And and yeah, this is this is sort of where we are evolving towards. As someone who kind of wants to automate a process, do I pick one bot provider to kind of do this for me, or is it just a generalized pool to which all of the bot providers can, all of the node runners um, can kind of um, tap into? So you can think of uh, Gelato as a marketplace uh, where the demand side is, um, you or like smart contract uh, applications uh, that need automation services. And the supply side is uh, the Gelato network of nodes. And um, nodes can offer their services on the Gelato network. They have to run our client implementation for that. Um, They have to enter um, their task executions via our smart contract protocol, uh, wherein uh, certain rules are enforced like payouts and so on. Um, But yeah, basically, um, you can think of Gelato as a module that you can um, plug in and get access to a decentralized um, market of nodes. So it's not just uh, like some people know that we have relay APIs and they sometimes mistake Gelato for a relayer. It's it's, it's not just a relayer. It is a network of relayers. So it is a module that you can plug into your your flow and uh, get access to a decentralized network of relayers, similar for smart contract automation. Yeah. So you don't have to pick one. You just pick Gelato, the network, and all of the 
basically what, what you get out of the box is a coordination mechanism that coordinates amongst a, a set of nodes. Okay, so um, I, don't, I don't have a personal relationship with any one uh, Gelato node provider. It's kind of like the network as a whole. Um, does it give me any, uh, basically what legacy uh, businesses would call SLAs? Or is this something that, uh, it, it, how, how, how do I know that if I use uh, Gelato for my decentralized backend, that it will perform? Yeah, that's a good question. So currently there's no such thing as SLAs or so, because I mean, we are uh, sort of an open web three style protocol that you can use. Currently, I suppose the SLA is uh, the the MEV that node operators get, right? So um, the way the protocol is designed is that for successful execution of your transaction, um, you have to pay a fee to cover the transaction fee and then some profits. So um, as long as you believe in like, you know, uh, people like or like node operators uh, wanting to make a profit in this network, you, sh you should be, you know, you can basically um, sleep well and know that someone will go and execute uh, your transactions at all time. Uh, given that the core premise of using Gelato network, um, the services there is that you have to pay for it, right? You have to pay the network for performing this, these services. So, so the incentives are designed in such a way that always, you know, similar to how um, public MEV works or to how Ethereum works, right? Like, uh, why do people keep mining blocks? Because they get a block reward. Uh, similar in Gelato, why will always will there always be a node executing your task? Well, because they get a reward for it. That's completely fair. So let's talk about the people who actually um, run the nodes. Do you, do you have any idea how many different entities there are? Are there any, um, are there any requirements I need to meet in order to run a node? So you said um, like staking providers and so on. That sounds like very involved. I mean, there's also things you can kind of do from a dApp node or so at home. Um, can, I, can I run Gelato on my dApp node? And if not, what are what what's the barrier to entry? Well, I think in in, in theory, yes. <laughs> in theory, you need an RPC, uh, so you need a connection to to the blockchain. You need like an access to a full node, maybe, and then you need some server uh, resources, right, to to run it. And this is all like the, the theoretical part of it. Now, um, in practice, of of course, Gelato, the the sort of like the the client implementation is fairly diverse and, and actually complex by now. <laughs> and uh, especially since we started off as, okay, we have this um, uh, uh, node, node implementation for smart contract automation, but since then it expanded quite a bit. And I think we have this very modular microservices-like architecture for, for Gelato clients. So uh, you run, like running a, um, running a Gelato node comes in like different flavors and you can sort of like opt into certain services that you would like to support because we have this uh, automation service, which is completely detached from the, the relay service, which is um, completely detached from our new off-chain computation service that is actually now coming out. Um, and so it, it sort of like depends on sort of what service you want to run. If you want to run like the most simple one, which is basically our execution service, which is just there to get a transaction and not even do the computation itself, just get the transaction and then get it mined for you, then I would say in theory, yes, you can do it in practice um, because Gelato is also like live on, let's say, I think over, over 10 different EVM chains today, right? You need like stable RPCs with most of them. Of course, you could choose to only serve Ethereum, for example, and, and do that. And then uh, um, like later this year, once we uh, go live with our V0.1 of staking, you could be able to just like buy some gel, stake it, and then participate in actually executing decent tra transactions. But then you also have to guarantee some uptime because if you're not up when you're supposed to, and you, if you're not executing transactions that get allocated to you at a certain time, then you will basically no longer receive transactions for, for, for like an interval as a punishment. So the way there is like this sort of mechanism uh, in place, which is, we um, we uh, incentivize you to stake gel. The more you stake, the more transactions you will be able to execute. But also, uh, if you get these uh, uh, executions allocated and you don't execute them, then you will also not get uh, the next one. So it's sort of like a, a game of more stake and high uptime. So as long as you can guarantee that, then yes, you will definitely be able to, to participate. You just um, kind of... Uh 
touched on the fact that, um, I mean, mostly so far we've talked about automation, right? Uh, you also kind of refer to relays just a bit ago. C can you kind of explain the distinction? Yeah, um, I can explain the difference here. So um, I used to call automation deferred relaying um, because automation is also a form of relaying, if you will. Um, it's this idea that a, a message, uh, an operation, a transaction um, that a user wants to see executed is relayed on that user's behalf. So the user themselves don't have to send this transaction. It's a relayer that puts it on chain for them. And automation is quite interesting because there we couple this transaction relay to a condition being fulfilled in the future. And um, that could be a deterministic condition like the passage of time, right? Like every day do something for me, or it could be a com like condition that is uh, not deterministic. Like if the price, uh, you know, uh, reaches uh, this, then execute for me. That might never happen actually, uh, or it might. So, um, so automation is this sort of um, relaying on steroids, if you will, where you you couple the relaying of a transaction to a arbitrarily user definable condition uh, on chain and now also off chain. Um, yeah, and then relaying is really the simple primitive of just uh, sending a transaction, and usually that is in the context of real time relaying. And actually, to be honest, it's uh, it, it sounds quite simple and so on. So that it's literally just saying, "Hey, put this transaction for me on chain." Uh, but it, it unlocks like this uh, much better UX for uh, Web3 users where now technically you can interact with a, an application on a blockchain in real time without needing to have crypto funds in your wallet, for example. This is known as gasless transactions or meta transactions um, where, where it, it's great for user onboarding, for example. Uh, you, you, can, you can use a relayer um, and a user can then come visit your app for the first time. Uh, and uh, interact with your smart contract already without needing to go to a centralized exchange first, do KYC and buy crypto or something to be able to send a transaction. So, so yeah, that's the, but but it's a bit more this real time uh, thing of like, hey, please uh, do this for me now. Relaying is also really cool for um, uh, not just for for users but also for backend developers, for example, that are multi chain. So, for example, Connext has been using Gelato Relay um, for over a year. And all, basically, they're a cross-chain bridge, and um, every Connex transaction is a Gelato relay transaction. And for Connex routers, they call them, it's very beneficial to use our relay APIs and relay network because uh, it, it makes it very easy to get transactions sent reliably um, on multiple chains at the same time at scale. So, so the relaying is also for us at least um, specializing in the art of you know um, scalable transaction throughput on multiple chains. And also decoupling payment like for, of native tokens for transactions um, removing this need for developers. So developers can, for example, nowadays with our one balance system, put USDC on Polygon, a balance, say $10,000 USDC, and then go and have uh, transactions um, in their applications be executed on multiple different chains while only paying from the single balance on one chain. So it, it makes the management, the transaction management uh, in, in the tens of thousands of transactions per day extremely easy um, when you use a relayer like Gelato. Uh, yeah. And here again, like Gelato is a network of relayers. So it, you can think of Gelato like as a single entry point for your relay transaction, but in the background, there's multiple relayers um, that are competing to execute these transactions. Before we dive into use cases um, a bit deeper, um, one final question on the automation. So as a user of the automation, um, I don't. I only have to pay once it's executed, right? So can I can I spam the system by kind of? Um, I, I mean, basically because the 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 nodes they have to check the conditions at certain cadences. Um, so if I just give them a lot of work um, in checking conditions that may never be met or that pop, that I engineer such that they're never met, can I kind of uh, uh, can I bring down the network? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so what you rightfully said is, um, what is automation? Automation consists of two parts. It's the off-chain computation that has to be done. And then it's the transaction relaying that has to be done at the right time um, when the condition is fulfilled, right? And um, you're, you're very right. If you create, I'd say, like a, a, a hundred thousand tasks or a million tasks that would never execute, you could bring down... Um, these sort of networks uh, because yeah there's no there's a lot of cost but there will never be a reward that's why 
um, many of like these systems. And, and I think this is sort of how we we started our V1 design, right? I think our beta or our alpha and V1 design of Gelato back then, which is, hey, we, we sort of put this, you put a bounty up and this bounty will then pay for the transaction. And then it's, I think everyone <laughs> started to like take it and, and copy it. And, and now it, like it turned into like the standard for <laughs> smart contract automation, but it's actually not a scalable and it's actually quite flawed. Um, and that's why, um, we, we realize also, and, and this is, this is also what uh, is being rolled out right now. And, and, and with our, um, newest release of, um, our basically automate 2.0 or, or also, like web free functions that we'll probably talk about in a moment. Um, we already um, redesigned the system uh, to such an extent that there are basically two payments you have to do and, um, or like there are two um, fees that are being paid. And this is the one fee is for the actual computation. And there uh, it's very like the analogy is very much basically looking at Gelato as like a decentralized AWS or Google Cloud. Um, which is a set of nodes, uh, not one particular data center somewhere, but a network of like self-hosted node operators somewhere in the world the, where you rent that computation for your decentralized application. And they run it at the same, they run it all the time as long as you pay them, of course. And then uh, they execute the transaction at the right time, right? And the execution of the transaction for us is actually done by the ex executor and the network and the uh, and the and the actual computation by by another part of 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 the of the network, and uh, there has to be like it's in order to make these systems really sustainable and scalable and work for everything, you need this sort of distinction between paying for computation and and, and so this is actually being rolled out um, right now um, as we as we speak. But the, the cool thing is. Um, you don't like you don't need to have, uh, let users deal with that, right? Similar to how users don't pay for the users on Netflix don't pay for the computation of AWS in the background, right? If, if you watch a movie there, even though they use AWS, similarly, like users of um, uh, let's say PancakeSwap or like a Dex, they they are not using they're not paying for the computation that is done by Gelato. They are paying PancakeSwap like a zero point one percent fee on each limit order that gets executed and, and they pay the, the computational fee, for example, right? Let, let's kind of change course here. Let's talk about uh, the Web3 functions first before we talk about use cases. You already kind of led into it. Um, so how, what, I mean, so now you kind of, you have to pay twice or the payment is split between kind of submitting um, the automation request and having it fulfilled. Any other updates? Yeah. So, so web free functions is, is I think something we, we have been talking about for, for quite some time. It's actually also in our white paper, which is okay. Like smart contracts are like, it's, it's cool to automate smart contracts and there's a lot of stuff you can do on chain. And we have seen an explosion of use cases, which we can talk about in a moment, but, um, the real cool use cases and the real efficiency you can gain is when you move the actual computation from on chain um, to to off chain, where you can do much more. Plus, if you move the data that can be used to automate your smart contracts from only being based on on chain data to then off chain data, and and this is I think where it gets really interesting because now basically what you can think of um, about like what free functions is, it's like a decentralized cloud function. So it's like a decentralized AWS Lambda, where you as a developer, you go and say, hey, I need to query um, a subgraph, for example, or like some API that returns me a list of all the NFTs that that that, that follow, uh, that have a certain criteria, right? All the NFTs that have a certain rarity, for example, right? And what I want to do is I want to check all these NFTs if they can be um cuddled with let's say there's a cuddle function on them right and i have to check whether they can be cuddled um and i want to check it and then once one of them can be cuddled i want to of course make sure that they get cuddled uh, at the right time right this is like a, a fun use case and um obviously doing this on chain is impossible you can't just query all the all the nfts that have that sort of property and that sort of rarity it's like 
first of all, computational, far too expensive, and second of all, mostly impossible because there's no good way of doing it sometimes. Certain like data is only visited by events, for example, or let's say they are not even stored on chain, like some information. You need to get them from API like IPFS. Maybe the metadata is on IPFS and you need to get it from there, right? So, um, and what, what you can do with three functions, basically you can write a, a TypeScript file, like rather than writing a smart contract that encodes the logic that determines what data to use and when to execute transactions, you now write a TypeScript file that you compile and deploy to IPFS. Now this lives on IPFS or other data availability layers that you can choose, um, or we can, we'll probably also expand it to, to other locations later. And you get an ID from IPFS out of it. And then you go to, to, to Gelato and you send a transaction on chain that says Gelato, Hey, pointing to this IPFS file, hey, Gelato nodes, please run for me this IPFS file that I just deployed there, uh, which determines the logic that I just described, and then execute transactions on my behalf to whatever chain I want to, uh, while providing me with certain levels of data integrity that the data that is being generated and is being used is actually the same uh, and, the, and the right one, right? And and yeah, this is, this is what you can do. And, and you can think about it as... Um, in allowing smart contracts to access cloud functions uh, with like a transaction. And, and this is super powerful for decentralized applications that don't want to like have one company that runs uh, a Google Cloud or whatever. And if they don't pay their bills or if they get censored or whatever, then the whole application goes down and relies on this, which many applications do these days. Um, this is basically a way to make them like to decentralize this process and make them more unstoppable. That's super powerful. But what does that do to your trust assumption as like, you know, a developer who's, who uses this? That's a good question. And, and, and this is also like the evolution and why decentralization for Gelato is now becoming very important. And I alluded at the beginning that at the beginning it, it was okay because trust was sort of on chain, right? Now we're moving to a world where uh, trust assumptions are higher because Gelato nodes are, are are running computation for you that you cannot verify on chain, and you need to you need to have some sort of trust in it. And so, uh, this is where uh, staking uh, and the decentralization of our network comes uh, in hand. And um, basically, how we are envisioning it is that um, you can define you have some sort of comparing this to other Oracle networks because it's some sort of like you can you can refer to it as as, as like partially like a hybrid Oracle network. And um, how we are sort of trying to provide users with like a like the, the flexibility of writing these things is just much greater than what you're used to in other networks. But what you can also do is you will be able to define what sort of um, integrity you need for that data. So, for example, you can say, "Hey, I want to have fifty or sixty percent of the Gelato nodes that have staked their gel to sign off on that data, and um, only if they all signed off on that data." Um, then I then a node can take that transaction and execute it, right? And so that way you have sixty uh, percent of the Gelato stake that is saying, "Hey, I, I I verified that data, and this is actually data that should be used." Um, and then, of course, if they are maliciously, they they will be slashed and can be can be penalized for this. But you can also say, let's say, my data is not that important, right? And I don't need that sort of integrity. I don't need six percent of the network to run this computation. I only need two nodes to run that computation. And you could also define some 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 lower thresholds here for you. It depends on the use case. But basically, now uh, staking and and having a valid data set becomes very important. Okay, I think that solves a lot of the problem, but. Is there some sort of escalation mechanism? So if I'm not happy with um, the execution, is there some sort of arbitration protocol that I can run? Because otherwise, what you're incentivizing is um, basically someone performs the computation maybe maliciously and other, other nodes are not incentivized to rerun the computation but can just piggyback, right? So basically, if everyone agrees um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's wrong but no one's penalized, then that's kind of... Uh, yeah, so can I ask it as um, a dev who uses this um, Oracle? Yeah, so so for that we have right now the Gelato DAO, right? So we have uh, our, our DAO right now where users can basically come and and say, hey, this is uh, what was executed. Um, and, and this is actually, I rerun the computation myself and this is actually what it's supposed to return, which is not always 100% it, 
it's not easy to make this 100% objective because if you talk about generalistic object computation, then it's, it's not, not only it's, it's, yeah. it's not all deterministic, uh, right? I, I think for in many use cases it actually is, especially if you talk about like um, subgraph data or, or, or data from other chains. Um, there, uh, it is deterministic. But if you if you think about um, let's say API price data, and, and it depends on which millisecond a node queried your price, right? There you have to like have some sort of um, defined aggregation um, and, and sort of consolidation of that data process defined. And this is what we meant with this, hey, you can define your own thresholds. Let's say you can say, hey, I want uh, these sort of nodes to, to run this and they have to agree that this is in a certain range or this is uh, roughly the same in these boundaries. And if it's the case, then I'm cool with that, right? And then they have to sign it off and send a transaction, right? And if you um, look back here and can say, hey, it was completely different, then you can basically start this escalation process, which is, um, hey, I, 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 I want to challenge this. And then there's basically uh, the DAO doing its job and, and, and validating it um, and, and, and making sure. But but right now, like there is there, there's no perfect way of sort of doing it for now which is always deterministic, objective, no subjectivity involved at all. So we are taking this sort of pragmatic approach to this. No, super exciting. So when when is this uh, when is this going to be rolled out? Well, actually, the beta starts today. So we we, we are rolling out the Web3 functions beta today. We actually also rolled it yesterday, but um, today it's it's going live. Live, but um, it is first of all in like a closed beta so we have around about like 30 projects 30 projects signed up for it now that will be immediately using it um and uh, a lot of really really cool and amazing use cases that i'm super excited for like nft perpetuals to um to to nft lending to uh, uh decentralized market making to, to like a lot of different things so the the use case array is really huge um, and the beta is there because um yeah there's a lot of stake here right and, and and data integrity is important and so we are slowly only onboarding new and new users uh, to to the system to make sure we can uh, scale this up secure this sufficiently uh, and make it work uh, smoothly for everyone um so yeah that's why it, it will probably still be in a closed beta for at least a couple of months cool this is a super nice segue to use cases so we've talked about kind of like the the nuts and bolts for the past 40 minutes. So kind of hit, hit hit me with what what has been built with it because it's been massively used. I mean there's millions of transactions that have been uh, that have been sent using gelato. So what what are the use cases and what networks are they on um, and what are what are you particularly proud of? Yeah, maybe I can give a little history, I guess, of use cases. Um, and really, um, what we discovered four years ago was that uh, Ethereum and other EVMs uh, need this generalistic um, automation or relay protocol that lives outside of the the, the client implementation of, of the blockchain. Um, and and really, this means that anything can be built on top of this. And And we've seen this really happening. Like, there have been use cases that we didn't foresee. And they're, they're, I mean, it all started with DeFi because we started Gelato in 2019 and in 2019 to 2021, I guess there was pretty much everything was DeFi, right? And then eventually NFTs happened, but but it started with DeFi. And um, and there, I mean, uh, the, the first use case actually were built by Instadep, by the Instadep team. So they are also legendary members of the Gelato club, if you will. And uh, they built uh, together with us some extremely complex uh, use cases, uh, automated debt refinancing. So these were things like, I think, automatically, uh, um, for example, automatically um, moving your other position to compound if compound has better APYs or something like this. I think this was the number one use case for Instadap for a whole while. And I know this is one of the things that I used Instadap for. It was just a single click and basically it just, you know, switched everything over. It was super neat. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they used Gelato to automate this. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was very heavy on the DeFi side. It was using flash loans and uh, this and that. And uh all of these things were checked, uh, basically, like um, all of these things were gelato conditions, like what flash loan to use, whether from DYDX uh, or from other or whatnot. And yeah, so so very heavy DeFi things were built first. Um, 
And, and then actually one of the first big use cases that we always uh, saw were limit orders, um, of course, for AMM. So anybody trading on centralized exchanges would usually place a limit order when they want to buy or sell something, right? Um, but on, on AMM, it's like Uniswap or Kaiba back then even, you didn't have this enabled. So with Gelato, uh, we built a limit order SDK that was uh, using a smart contract limit order protocol. Um, and uh, yeah, basically this is how um big amms like spooky swap on phantom uh, and quick swap on polygon and pancake swap on uh, bnb chain uh, all basically were able to offer limit orders on their exchange to users which is in the background using gelato automation uh, and and then from there i mean eventually once we built our um, automation ui and interface uh, gelato automate previously called gelato ops um, we basically then gave uh, developers a, a sort of nice way of, um, you know, self-servicing them, um, themselves before it was sort of us, uh, you know, the tech was ready, like it, it could be used, but there was a lot of work you as a developer needed to do. And, to, and we also didn't have that much documentation. Technically, you could have used Gelato to build anything, but, but it, you know, you know how it is. You, you have to make developers' lives easier for, for them to actually use it. So we built this super nice pro UI product where you can come app.gelato.network and you can basically uh, start automating your smart contracts with the click of a mouse button basically uh, and that really i mean that sort of opened the floodgates to use cases there were so many things launching without us even knowing uh, that suddenly we're using the network um i remember uh, algorithmic stable coins using it um for uh, for rebasing um many other things i'm sure hilma will give some more color soon um and then for for relaying um for relaying, uh, initially our approach to relaying was a bit more backend focused. So really focusing on how can we provide uh, backend projects such as, for example, Connex, the cross-chain messaging protocol, they're using it um, with a way to get transactions uh, mined on multiple chains uh, with high throughput, like really at scale, because that's actually quite hard. Um, building your own relayer sort of to send a couple of transactions uh, Hundreds of transactions every day is, is not that hard, but going from there to 40,000 transactions, 100,000 transactions per day on many different networks reliably, that's then really hard. And that's production software. So we, we sort of started with that and that has been successfully used by Connex for over a year without any problems. Um, and um, and and, uh, and recently in, in the last half year or so, we also focused a bit more on the UI side of things for Relink, so gasless transactions, um, uh, account abstraction, all these things, um, making it easy to onboard Web2 users and not so much uh, the focus on having, I don't know, a throughput of 100,000 transactions per day for your backend application, but rather having these cool user experiences where as a user, you can interact with smart contracts without the need of having crypto in your wallet and so on. Um, so so there, um, there will be, uh, I think, uh, some exciting use cases uh, launching soon. Um, yeah, for example, um, we're talking to a betting site on Nosa's chain who want to make it so that users, first time users, first time crypto users can come and place their bet without needing to, to have crypto in their wallets, um, for example. Super cool. Hilma, do you want to add to the landscape of projects building on Gelato? Because if, if not, um, I'd like to talk about account abstraction, um, but Lewis kind of insinuated that you would that you would want to add some color and as we heard earlier you're kind of basically the same person so i i assume lewis knows what you want <laughs> i think lewis already covered a lot i think uh maybe uh to add there's like weird things that i personally didn't anticipate are all these nft use case because we are both from like the DeFi world but but suddenly we we've, we've seen like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions from like NFT rentals, for example, I don't know, like I didn't know people rent so many NFTs, but they're like these entire NFT rental marketplaces now where you can get an NFT, you can literally get the NFT into your wallet, let's say like a board uh, A, for example, and then you can do something and then Gelato will out of like there's a function in the transfer from function. There's like a condition which is Gelato can get this NFT out of your wallet in seven days again and withdraw it back to the original owner. And this is like happening. So literally smart contracts are, or the NFTs are, are given to you and then like drawn back in by Gelato. And this is happening every day, like tens of thousands of times on Polygon and BNB chain, BNB and, and stuff like that. So 
th these are things that beyond like MakerDAO using it for like their collateral management and in, like stuff like optimism for topping up sequencer nodes and stuff like that, which are use cases we sort of seen very early on. These are like ones that did that really surprised me personally seeing. Right into monkey. Yeah, I think I think what both Hilma and I were quite happy and, and proud of is um, that we really saw the you know uh, one one guy team developer using this uh, up to you know the blue chip DeFi projects like Ave uh, Maker um, Optimism and 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 uh, and so on. So so really, it, it's it's for everyone. Cool. So account abstraction. So I think a lot of our listeners will kind of know this in the context of EIP 4337. This is actually something that we're working on together. So uh, not, not we as Epicenter, but me as Gnosis. And uh, this is kind of finding an implementation for account abstraction um, without protocol level changes, just using relayers. It's an incredibly cool use case. And I actually can see, um, so we are committed to kind of rolling this out on Gnosis chain. And I would kind of assume that this, um, this goes well and kind of is taken over by other chains as well. So can you explain to me how it works? Yeah. Um, so account abstraction really is the concept of trying to move away from having users interact with smart contracts with their externally owned account and rather promoting that they are interacting with a smart contract wallet based uh, or a smart contract based account and that these are the two accounts that are available on ethereum one is created via your private key um, and then the other one you have to deploy yourself, uh, let's say uh, the Gnosis safe is, is probably the most prominent example of a smart contract wallet. Um, and the cool thing about a smart contract wallet is uh, I like to compare them as um, one is like an old school door lock where you have like this wooden a key that you get in and then you can, can kind of like access web free. And then the other one is like this digital um, door lock that we have in our office here. Uh, where you can program people to just like come in for like a day or so, or you need multiple people to sign off to enter the, the building, for example, right? And so it's a programmable wallet. A smart contract wallet is a programmable wallet where you can encode advanced functionalities, for example, that you can make transactions be fully gasless uh, on behalf of users without having to change any smart contract code anymore. And um uh, this just greatly improves the UX of, of, of users that are especially getting onboarded to Web3. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's this whole array of like um, uh, feature sets that you want, for example, gas transactions, account recovery, but also in wallet automation, which I think I'm, I'm sort of most bullish on in, in account abstraction. Um, and uh, yeah, we actually sort of experiment and been building account abstraction stuff since the very beginning. Gelato was actually started off as the a module for the Gnosis safe. This was our first implementation of Gelato. And it was it was literally, hey, you have your smart contract wallet and now you have like an add-on to the smart contract wallet to make it really, really smart. And it could it can automate, it can execute things on your behalf when you're not there. This is for me like a smart wallet, right? Um, and uh, we actually deployed Gnosis Saves on our first UIs back then and, and had like had users interact with our application using their Gnosis Save as, as a proxy, which is exactly what account abstraction wants to achieve um, and uh, sort of enshrine into uh, the protocol a bit further by uh, with this ESC 437, for example, which uh, basically allows provides people with like a, a public uh, entry point to then to then say, hey, I want to interact with a certain application, uh, and they can uh, define how they want to interact, with, how they want to pay for it, for example, and then there's this uh, public entry point where you can, can do so. So yeah, this is account abstraction, in Russia, but there, it's a very broad topic, so there are a lot of different parts you can go into if you want. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's it's a super big topic, and I think in terms of kind of making Web three usable for normies. This is really something that kind of we need to hit um, because, I mean, the current onboarding experience, you need to be able to onboard users with, with an email or similar, um, even if that means lower trust assumption. You, you, you just have to be able to switch it out 
later. The user has to be able to switch it out later. But you know, this experience where kind of you you download MetaMask for someone, and then then you say, I'm not going to look, but you have to write down these 12 words, and you, you can never lose them. So replicate them, you know, in many places. But you can also never show them to anyone. So replicate them never. It, it just it's it's a lot of mixed messages, and people don't get it. It's just this is not how we're going to onboard like the next hundred million people or so, right? And until EIP 4337 actually comes, if it comes, I think it'll be an uphill battle in terms of it's pretty complex and, you know, backwards compatibility and such. What other things are you excited for? So, I mean, with um, the Web3 functions, uh, you kind of, you radically enlarge the possibility space of what can be built using gelato so what are the cool things you kind of you foresee um and uh what are you excited for yeah maybe i, I can start and louis feel free to add stuff and so i think maybe tying it back to the account abstraction if, for for me this all sort of for me i with gelato especially i see all these things converging at some point so right now um, to provide users within sort of these advanced automated services or use cases, let's say a limit order on PancakeSwap, or let's say yearn uh, with like, hey, we always give you the best rate where whatever, or, or other, uh, other use cases, what you always had to do is you had to build entire smart contract protocols, which logic is solely based to provide this sort of automation for users in a way where they can, let's say, they just have to deposit their assets into like this pool. And then from this pool, a limit order gets executed or from this pool, um, the, the, it, it will be invested in the best yield generating protocol or whatnot. And mostly the reason why we have this is because um, you can't automate transactions from the user's EOA wallet, right? So uh, other than getting their private key, <laughs> then yeah, you basically own their money, right? So if we can, as a community, push this uh, concept of account abstraction and smart contract wallet, then what we gain is basically um, what I call in-wallet automation, which is you don't need to build all of these protocols anymore. You can just tie your money or your funds in your wallet to arbitrary off-chain data computation or on-chain verifiable data and computation with Gelato, for example, and can start getting the best yield everywhere straight out of your wallet. You don't have to pool them anywhere. You don't have to send them anywhere first. Just straight out of your wallet, they do things. Uh, think about like games, for example, right? You can build like... you can. Uh, play strategy games where you run a script that interacts with your account on your behalf uh, or with other people's accounts on their behalf and like direct their actions in like a, a Pokemon world. Like uh, for me, I see NPCs, non-player characters, all of them will be like a smart contract which will attack you. Like say a Pokemon game, you walk through the grass and suddenly Pokemon attacks you. It's like an attack function there. And then Gelato sends a transaction, the Pokemon comes, attacks you, and then it's like a battle and you fight the Pokemon even if you might not be at the machine at the time. You define your strategy beforehand and then you can alter it over time. So I think there um, with account abstraction plus uh, automation, especially leveraging data from off-chain, I think you just full like you 10x or 100x the possibilities that can be built for web3 um and it all ties it very nicely together so I, i'm super excited about like how, how this and i already see a couple of use cases and projects building first things like brahma is building basically like a yearn but based on those saves using gelato in the background so i think I'm, I'm super excited about these type of use cases and they tie everything very nicely together yeah um one of the big things that I am excited about um, is uh, basically a whole new Web3 user experience. Um, we are all Web3 natives here. Uh, I know I've known you for for years now, Friederike, so you were definitely very early and probably 
um, you are used to using MetaMask and so on, but but you also mentioned here that it's still very clunky when onboarding new users. It's still always like every time I onboard a friend or family member, it's I realize how bad it is and that it will never be mainstream because it's way too complex. Um, and one thing um, that we have to hand to Web2 is that the user experiences there are really great uh, a lot of times. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think we have to uh, achieve parity with that in Web three, um, if not even surpass it. Uh, and uh, in Web three, we have created these amazing backend technologies um, that make developer experiences very great. Right, like you can build your own bank, you can build whatever, like with a bunch of lines of code. Um, but on the front end, on the UI level, on the mobile app level, it's still is very immature it's it scares people off uh, it's it, it's it's clunky it, it's kind of horrible to be honest so what i'm what i'm really hoping for now that um, as we move up the stack a bit and we sort of provide technologies like the relay apis that we have account abstraction smart contract wallets to front end developers is that uh, we uh, we finally have a better front end to web3 as well not just a good back end and and here what i'm looking out for hopefully next bull run uh, is that we don't have these things where you definitely know that this is a Web3 site where you log in with MetaMask, you connect to some RPC, everything is slow, you can't do anything because you don't have crypto in your wallet, you have to go visit three other places uh, now to get crypto, to do to configure your wallet, to write something on paper and um, store it in a safe or something, right? Like, like all of this should be gone and uh, hopefully we can build Web3 applications where users don't even know that they're interacting with Web3 only the developers of that site now because they're using the power of Web3 technologies to build amazing uh, backends, uh, to build amazing applications um, without the need of, I don't know, Web2 legacy licensing or so. Um, so, so yeah, really like that's what I'm really, really looking forward to. And and here uh, our, uh, our basically stake in this game is uh, our set of Relay APIs. You can certainly use automation as well to provide very nice user experiences, but but especially with relaying and account abstraction, uh, you can build amazing uh, new user experiences um, where I hope it will, will simply be like, okay, we forget completely about connecting MetaMask and what's, whatsoever. Like all of this will be gone. It will just be a nice website and you go to clicking buttons again, you immediately see data and so on and you don't have to have this extension be connected and so on at all times. Like it, it should be, be very smooth sort of in, uh, instant feedback as you use a website to interact with crypto. That's, that's really what I'm looking forward to. Me too. Having Web3 with strictly better user experience than Web2, this is, uh, those are goals. <laughs> Fantastic. I have one last question, and maybe it's the most important question that I considered leading with. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? You don't, you don't get to be called gelato without, you know, having a That's good true. answer to that. <laughs> That's true. And, and I do look forward to the, to the next DevCon and the the gelato booth there again. Oh yeah, the most the the favorite booth of all DevCon attendees where you get gelato. Uh, we literally saw people going there eight times in a single day <laughs> <laughs> to get gelato. Like there was this guy who sk he skipped lunch and everything. It was crazy. Um, he lunch, <laughs> he lunch, was, lunch was also, I think, it vegan or maybe maybe just vegetarian, but it was very healthy. So basically, th th this was also one of the main complaints about DAPCON this year that the food was too healthy. But you were there to you were there to you know to to rescue the staff yeah. attendees, the saviors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. but having having a free ice cream truck is definitely a DOS vector. That's for sure. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, we we got a grease there. Um, so for 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 me, if for me, my personal favorite flavor still is um, the and, and this is actually how I <laughs> what I ordered when I was a child when I I spent all my pocket money on on gelato, and um, I went to this gelato place uh, close by and I ordered eight scoops. And it was, <laughs> it, 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 I ordered eight scoops and I, I did it on like a, on like a bi weekly basis most likely, and uh, it, there were. Um, a lemon chocolate chili and lemon chocolate cherry. So, so the so I like lemon and chocolate, and it's specifically just a, a hint of chili and some sweetness with the cherry, and then you get a ah. Uh, you have opinions. You have opinions on this. And Louis, what about you? Yeah, I think for me it's pistachio. And uh, by the way, I have to uh, plug the amazing ice cream 
shop that is next to Full Note in Berlin. Duo. Uh, uh, yes, it's it's amazing. The Sicilian ice cream there. So um, yeah, it was the perfect place to start gelato in 2019 and have some of the bear market bitterness be washed away with some nice sweet gelato from the shop uh, close by. Fantastic. If people want to find out more about gelato or use gelato or become uh, active in the gelato community, where do we send them? 100%. So first of all, gelato.network is the website. There you find all the various resources and links. Uh, the most active uh, channel for us is Discord. There, if you're a Web3 developer, you're starting out or you're an advanced person who wants to go deep into gelato, just come there and, and chat with us. Um, and then, of course, follow us on Twitter. We are also producing a lot of video content on YouTube, so make sure to try to uh, follow us on YouTube as well. We'll probably do some cool vlogs for Eve Denver. So if you're not there and can't participate but still want to experience it, uh, make sure to check out our, our vlog there. And and yeah, so Discord is, is, is the best one. And Twitter, of course. Fantastic. Thank you both for coming on. This was uh, super fun. Thanks. Thank you.